Welcome everybody to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new here, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two that are online, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you are at all interested in learning more about us, please feel free to uh, view us at iwp.edu. And to support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu backslash donate. Before we begin the lecture, we ask that you take a moment to silence all electronic devices. So I'll give you just a second here. Thank you. Today we'll be hearing from Captain Wendell Bryant, who will deliver a lecture entitled Chernobyl, the first domino in the fall of the Soviet Union. Wendell P. Bryant III is an MA candidate for statecraft and national security affairs, focusing on national defense. His primary interest is the emerging technologies in cyber warfare, namely artificial intelligence and mass data collection, and ultimately their significant importance in continuing to ensure US national security now and into the future. Originally from Tennessee and a captain in the United States Army, he enjoys all sports with a special place in his heart for ultimate Frisbee. He is also an avid lover of movies and TV shows, video games, reading, writing, food experimentation, socializing, poker, and politics. Please help me welcome Captain Wendell Bryant. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendell Bryant. I'll be presenting a discussion uh, on Chernobyl. Um, I'm not really a gifted orator, so bear with me as I uh, slowly grind through this, but uh, it should be um, interesting with a couple of um, pieces of information about Chernobyl itself, uh, the impacts on the Soviet Union, and ultimately how we can learn from that. Uh, I'm told or to do or say something comedic uh, is the best way to start any presentation that might be uh, a little bit boring. So it started off on a good start. So here's a, here's a communist joke for you. Stalin walked up to a farmer. Comrade Stalin, our farm has so many potatoes that if you stack them one on top of the other, they would reach God. Stalin looked at the farmer and said, there is no God. The farmer smiled back and there are no potatoes. From my limited personal observation of the world, to build a better database of communication amongst leaders, we must apply four primary attributes to any situation, academic, historical, learned experience, and common sense. Taking these four elements allows us to rapidly receive data, organize it into information, consume that knowledge, and package it into, digestible, into a digestible format to ultimately create a clear and shared understanding amongst the greatest number of people. I would like to be begin this conversation by clarifying what I mean by Chernobyl being the first domino that resulted in the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was not the fundamental reason why it collapsed, or at least not one of the primary reasons. It was a lifting of the veil to the world that was it was not as it all seems. The porcelain cracks that were once easily masked were for the first time observable to the world at large. Illusion, facade, and perception were absolutes, uh, absolutes to Soviet leadership. So much so, Gorbachev himself said, our power comes from the perception of our power. He was noted in several staff meetings saying that exact line over and over again. The world was unaware of how fragile the Soviet empire was, and one mistake resulting in its exposure, though it was significant in its own regard, resulted in permanent damage to that perception. The environmental, economic, and geopolitical impact of the events at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant facility was a poison pill, both figuratively and realistically. The nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl was the proverbial, proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. But like I stated moments ago, there were many other negative factors simultaneously affecting the Soviet Union's ability to operate. The compounding pressure of the international community observing and judging what was once thought to be an unstoppable juggernaut was now seen as something less. 
There are three main points I would like to discuss in this short lecture that are vital to understanding the events associated with the Soviet Empire's collapse before, during, and after the events of Chernobyl. First, what other factors were the Soviet, was the Soviet Union dealing with during this time? What factors were the United States dealing with? Second, what were the actual impacts of the disaster itself? And third, what can we learn from these events and can we apply them to modern day geopolitical, the geopolitical environment today? So, what was the Soviet Union grappling with during the late 1970s and 80s? From their perspective, they looked to be slowly defeating the American imperial capitalists after almost a decade of very public failures. Understandably so, the United States had failed domestically and internationally in the 1970s to include the withdrawal from Vietnam, Watergate, the oil, uh, Arab oil embargo that is associated with the inflation crisis, the early end to the Apollo missions, the Iranian hostage crisis, the hippie counterculture movement, and the Three Mile Island accident. Regardless of the reality of these events, the global perception of the US coupled with the Soviet propaganda machine was that communism was succeeding where capitalism looked to be failing. Watergate occurred in 1972 when it was a global news for almost several months. Such a significant event was easily warped to suggest the United States was a corrupt capitalist state at the highest levels. The Soviet Union had no corruption at the top. If someone failed, they were rapidly replaced and information on the matter was extremely well censored or spun. The inflation crisis in the 1970s damaged the American economy to degrees not seen since the Great Depression. The two massive inflation spikes of 12% in 1975 and 14% in 1979 occurred in direct response to the oil, Arab oil embargoes. The drastic increase in the price of oil-based products in the United States resulted in a 400% increase in fuel prices in just five months. Being the free market leader of the world, the United States economic crisis was in fact a world economic crisis. However, the Soviet Union was dealt limited or no economic damage from the crisis because it was not dependent on Middle Eastern oil at this time. It had its own reserve that it began accessing in greater quantities in response to this event made more money because of this event, and it was public proof that there was a significant fragility within the capitalist imperialist, imperialistic economic system. The Soviet Afghanistan war was spinning up with several rapid victories early in the war in 1979 and 1980. While the end of the Vietnam War was still a bitter memory to many Americans and to the globe at large. This provided the Soviet Union the global perception of being able to effectively wield their military power and influence to achieve successes where the imperialists had failed. NASA had canceled its Apollo 18, 19, and 20 missions. The Soviet Union did not hesitate to use this as proof that the program had failed, the Americans had wasted massive amounts of wealth, and that the Americans were no longer masters of space. The Iranian hostage crisis in 1979 and the following special operations launched by the U.S. to end that situation resulted in public humiliation for the United States government and three separate special operation commands. The perception of American force projection and general global influence was impacted. It was easy for the Soviet Union to not only magnify the failure, but to also display that the best soldiers the United States had to offer had failed. Though the tenets of that operation are easily debatable, regardless, the perception combined with, once again, the propaganda machine of the Soviet Union, was priceless information ammunition for the Soviet, Un Soviet Union globally. I think it is relevant to point out the differences between misinformation and disinformation at, the, at this time. Mis misinformation is false information that is disseminated not on purpose, but by accident. Something like forwarding a news article on social media. Disinformation, on the other hand, is intentionally disseminating false information to manipulate consumers, it is most powerful when it's coupled with the truth, that parts of it are true and parts of it are false, and it's hard to dis discern what is true and what is false. The Soviet Union was a master at disinformation. The US hippie counterculture movement grew from the early 1960s and throughout the 1970s. It was the dream and ammunition the Soviet Union desired. Capitalists were embracing significant tenets of communist ideology. 
They were proof that communism was superior and to many was one of the primary reasons why the US withdrew from Vietnam. The Soviet empire was winning the Cold War through the hearts and minds of young Americans. Then the Three Mile Island uh, accident occurred also in 1979. It was a testament to a truth that the American capitalists were technologically inferior, cut corners, corrupt, and dangerous to themselves and the world. But only a few short la uh, years later, I'd like to quote the office, well, 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 how the turntables. In 1981, a new president was elected. The same day as his inauguration, the hostages, hostages, the Iranian hostages were released. New US policy began methodically pressuring the Soviet Union on several fronts. The US first began squeezing the rest of the international community to stop loaning the Soviet Union money and decrease overall trade with the empire. Additionally, the US began massive, ex massively expanding the, its military while arming the Afghans to elongate the war and inflict significantly more damage on the, their Soviet occupiers. In response, the Soviet Union began to match US military expenditures while losing significant amounts of financial access coupled with significant increases in casualties in Afghanistan and an unclear path to quelling the local population created immense pressure both domestically and internationally for the Soviet Union. And then President Gorbachev was made president in 1985. He began implementing, implementing policies that provided Soviet satellites more autonomy and freedom. These were drastic changes to a system that was designed around suppression. 11 months later, Chernobyl exploded. My dad always said it is better to be lucky than good. If any one of these attributes had been, not been in play, whether it was a new president, whether Soviet or American, new Soviet policy, the war in Afghanistan, American military buildup, economic pressure or financial pressure, the Soviet Union may have survived this accident. The impacts of the actual event of Chernobyl were devastating to say the least. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant, officially named the Vladimir I. Lenin nuclear power plant, exploded on 20, April 26, 19, uh, 1986 in Pripyat, Ukraine. Uh, mind you, it's named after Vladimir Lenin. It was the premier nuclear facility, which made it even more important that something did not go wrong. Reactor, four, uh, reactor number four, uh, its core detonated from water pressure, resulting in a breach in containment, releasing levels of radiation never witnessed by humanity in all of our history. I would like to point out that a nuclear power plant does not have the capacity to set in motion a nuclear explosion like from a nuclear warhead, but it can release untold amounts of radiation for massive amounts of time. The incident it resulted in a 700 billion adjusted dollar damage to the region. Between 31 and 60 direct deaths are associated with it. Between 4,000 and 92,000 indirect deaths. Between 35, uh, 350,000 and 385,000 Soviet citizens were permanently relocated. A 2,600 kilometer exclusion zone was created that will be uninhabitable for the next 300 years. It's a little bit smaller than the state of Rhode Island. Between 100 and 200,000 abortions, miscarriages, and infant deaths are directly linked to the event. And unnatural levels of radiation can still be detected across the entire continent. Can we change the slide? Um, let me show you. So that's the most important slide in the presentation that shows you uh, the radiation levels about six months after the e event. So as you can tell, it spans all the way to Spain uh, and there's still unnatural levels of radiation still throughout Europe. Now it's not enough to cause any issues, but it just tells you how much of an impact the, the uh, uh, meltdown actually had. In comparison, the Three Mile Island incident resulted in only $1 billion worth of damage with no loss of life, no containment breach, and no contaminated lands. Several systems were at play that set the stage for such a disaster to occur. The US built nuclear generators for about $200 million a piece. Uh, that included the rest of the world because the United States assisted uh, allies in building their nuclear facilities in, for, in most cases. 
The Soviet Union, on the other hand, spent about $50 million. Now, the reason why it was so cheap for the Soviet Union was because they decided that having containment facilities was no longer necessary, or not necessary in the first place, that the system was viable enough to not use containment. A testament to American engineering, the nuclear power plant at Fukushima, Japan, built by GE, dealt with a triple reactor meltdown after surviving a 9.1 earthquake as designed, resulting in a single death, and that's after the fact. Though the correlating tsunami was not anticipated, the redundancies did exactly what they were designed to do. The Soviets ignored sound safety practices, had almost no redundancies, and used low quality fuel rods. This, coupled with an ideology that failure was not an option, resulting in forced obedience, incompetence, fear, censorship, deception, and perception, exacerbated the environment to boiling over, exploding, and the attempt at masking it resulted in magnifying its effects. The impact on morale within the Soviet Union's first public failure is incalculable. It was clearly catastrophic to the momentum of the regime. Even Gorbachev said, the nuclear meltdown at Chernobyl was perhaps the real cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union five years later. Now, he may have very well been trying to defend himself by saying that, but at the same time, if you look at how the world responded to the Soviet Union post Chernobyl, there is obvious uh, information that, that points to that. How can we learn from the events of Chernobyl? I think it is pertinent to fully understand the perspective of the vast majority of the West. They believe the Soviet Union was stable up until the day it, day it collapsed. Now, IWP and the professors here may have known or at least believed that it wasn't as strong as a general consensus, but this was an outlier mentality and was not the majority belief at the time. What we learned is that the American way is a great way. It isn't the only way, but our way is successful. And I think this was inherently by accident. The United States had consistently seen the Soviet Union as an equal, and in certain years, as having the advantage. However, the facade the Soviet Union built was designed for short-term solutions that required rapid, constant, and dynamic problem solving to man maintain a complex and uh, sophisticated set of lives. The Soviet Union's power was based in perception more than anything, with significant limitations in reality. The need to hide failures and mistakes was believed to be vital to their organizational hierarchy by their leadership from the beginning to the end. The United States, on the other hand, as I alluded to, approached our mistakes with an ideology that was globally foreign. We publicly addressed our mistakes to the entire world. I do not believe that it was known how important this was for the health of the United States, but it was vital. It was a new form of governance that was coupled with freedom of speech, new technology, and the Cold War superpower dichotomy. A superpower of any variety in all of human history had never exposed its failures as publicly or as thoroughly as the US did and still does to this day. It naturally allowed a public conversation to healthily address each issue and deal with them accordingly, resulting in significantly more effective and more permanent solutions. So basically the Soviet Union was really good at short term fixes, but because the United States was able to actually openly address those issues, there was a more permanent or more long term fix in the process. This inherently united American citizens closer together in a unified effort to co counter communism. Americans and the happy accident of open self-reflection created a more durable America than ever before. I think uh, a great uh, kind of caveat into this is I think China is exhibiting similar tendencies to that of the Soviet Union to include their censorship, their economic concerns, mainly in their housing and commercial construction, private wealth ties, foreign outreach, and military expansion. The pattern is similar, it's definitely not the same. And finally, to conclude, the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union's demise was not an action or inaction, but the unmasking of the system, its failures, and its de deception to not only the world, but to its own people. Thank you. Uh, any questions? So do you think that the Russian invasion of Ukraine and subsequent not going super great for them in Ukraine right now 
could be another Chernobyl moment for the current Russian Federation, where maybe in, I'm not saying overnight, but maybe in the next five to ten years, you can see a dissolution of the Russian Federation. Oh, I absolutely definitely could see that. Um, so just just from uh, uh, I, the IC in general, what you're seeing is a collective understanding that the Russian Federation's military was exaggerated in both size and capability. Uh, so they're performing well beneath what we anticipated them to be able to do. Uh, obviously, you want to always uh, uh, plan for your uh, op opponents to be stronger than they actually are. You plan for the worst case scenario. Uh, but uh, Russia is performing well below expected um, standards in, in the war. Uh, I think that also has to do, and I think this is kind of going down a rabbit hole, but you have to consider that Ukraine fought with Russia and Soviet Union uh, in Afghanistan. And so that allowed Ukraine to apply tactics they knew the Russians would implement while invading the country. So they were dealing with 70-year-olds teaching, you know, teaching young soldiers, this is what we did in Afghanistan I promise you that's what these guys are gonna to do too. I fought with them. And so that allowed the Ukrainians to anticipate what the Russians did. And what should have been from both, I think four different countries, the United States, Great, uh, United Kingdom, Russia, and China, all assessed that Ukraine would fall in 96 hours. All of them, and they're all wrong. And I think that had a lot to do with it as they under, uh, underestimated the tenacity of the Ukrainian people uh, their identity. They do not. They do not think they are Russian, and because of that, that, that energy, you can't you can't quantify that. It's really hard to understand someone that's willing to die for their belief, for their freedom, and that just gives them like so, like a you never corner a tiger, and that's what they did. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how do you see now that? Uh Putin is literally running out of options, even if there's no military leader. And then having very little, uh, you know, like trying to call North Korea, like trying to call other sources, not that not necessarily going to work out at all. And in addition, pulling uh, people out of the prisons. That's not working out at all, especially during Hitler. That person turns a gun on the Russian uh, military itself. So, how do you see him then possibly then trying to uh, again undermine yeah, this, what's going on with, uh, with the constant you can hang with the sort of nuclear threat over everyone's head, uh, but not specifically. Curious point is when they went into Chernobyl and then when they, before they left Chernobyl, he was sending his own troops in uh, to excavate land and so forth. And they had no protection. And why do you think he would send people in with no protection to do excavation and have little purpose? And what, what was that a test for? Um, well, that's, that's a, that's a big thing to unpack. Uh, so I'm going to kind of try to go from the end to the beginning of what you just discussed. So the first thing is, is I don't think President Putin has a lot of hands on with the actual war occurring in Ukraine. So when we point at Putin, yes, he's the leader and he makes the mistakes, but you have to consider his generals are the ones leading the operations there. And so there's, uh, the last time the Russians were in a legitimate war, and we can point to Crimea being a war if you wanted to, but it was very short-lived, very fast. Well, we could point to Georgia, but that was relatively short-lived as well. Uh, but the last real significant elongated war that Russia ever has dealt with is in uh, Chechnya. Uh, and so you have a lot of soldiers that did not have experience, uh, including leaders. Uh, so you have generals just making very they're making mistakes because they're just not used to actioning. Uh, to, to take another step back towards your question, uh, additionally, the Russian budget was $61 billion for their military last year. Now, mind you, that is that pales in comparison to the, the uh, United States and Chinese, but the problem isn't the $61 billion. It's the actual dollars getting down to the equipment and soldiers and allocations. 
And what we're seeing is, is the Russian military was suggesting it had roughly 7,700 tanks uh, available for combat, and it was about 20% of that number because they weren't operable, because they weren't receiving their parts to fix their tanks, make sure they were maintaining operational readiness. Uh, and so that has a lot to do with corruption. Uh, it, it's, it's very foreign to Americans, especially me. Uh, so because I'm, I'm in the military, I'm an, I'm an army captain. And the reason I bring that up is because it is extremely difficult to be corrupt in the US Army right now. Uh, the system is very significant in, in making sure no one can steal. Now, there's obviously some things you can get away with. There's always gonna be someone that can figure out a way around how, how this system works. But overall, um, taking money from the US military is extremely difficult. On the other hand, Russia, for the longest time, has been operating in a black market mentality. Like following the end of the Soviet Union, about 70% of their economy was underground. That doesn't mean black market, they were just avoiding taxes. And so that obviously damaged Russia's ability to operate as a country in the first place. But uh, a further step is, is you don't actually know what's occurring economically. And so when the Soviet Union collapsed and you had these oligarchs basically take over entire regions of the economy, uh, they began exercising in a, in a manner the government couldn't really control because they were just ignoring the government. They, it was basically run by gangs for about eight years. Uh, so that's obviously very damaging. And it's very, once again, very foreign to us. I think the last time we had organized crime running a city was what, in the 80s uh, in New York City? Uh, maybe Chicago, but we'd have to go way back to see like actual or significant organized crime being able to exercise that kind of authority in the United States. Um, to, uh, let's see here, I'm trying to remember all your points. Um, Particularly to the black point, where they, where knowing like what the situation, as, as again, your map shows, and the spread of the contaminated area, and knowingly having troops there, and then knowingly send those troops in unprotected in any way, shape, or form to perform excavation for no uh, discernible reason. So I can actually talk to the excavation. So they're actually digging in trench and, and foxholes for uh, IDF protection or indirect fire protection. So that they weren't digging for something, they were digging to protect themselves. They just happened to be in a region of the country that was also radiated. Uh, so I think that was just bad tactical maneuvering by generals putting them in positions that was radiated. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm unaware of that data, but that would make sense. If they're stationed right next to Chernobyl, I would not leave my soldiers there. They would all die. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Um, but you have to, like, like going back to my point, um, a lot of the generals were either unaware or they were handing down orders without following through. Uh, so like one of the tenets of a leader is, uh, in combat at least, I would assume, in corporate world as well, is that sometimes you have to go there with your soldiers to make sure you have eyes on and understand what's happening on the battlefield. And if you're not there, not understanding what's going on, it'd be kind of like a, a doctor telling the nurse to do the surgery. Well, sometimes that does happen, the, the, where the nurse doesn't do the surgery itself, but does parts of the surgery. For the most part, the doctor comes in and makes sure the nurse does it right until they feel comfortable with the nurse doing those small things. Uh, so it, it, on a much more micro scale, that's, that's what the general should be doing but because they've lived in a world of luxury, if you will, sitting in an office doing nothing, and then suddenly 30 years later, now they haven't, yeah, 30 years, uh, they, they're actually having to deal with the war. It, it definitely turns uh, in, in a, what should be a relatively easy operation tactically into a complicated one, coupled with, like I said earlier, Ukraine actually fighting back, which was not anticipated. Hopefully that answered your question. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, having um, lived during that time period in the region that's circled red, <laughs> having been in the Ukraine at the Chernobyl Museum, I would like to uh, offer a phenomenal book if you are interested in to continue to read about Chernobyl. This is for everyone. It, it, it's on Chernobyl. The author is Serhi, S-E-R-H-I, Klokhi. E-L-O-K-H-Y. And the book is written in the way of the experience of the people who 
who lived in Chernobyl during the time of this catastrophe and linking what had happened to your topic of that this is the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. At the end of the day, the people realize that communism is a lie. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And that is what brought the Soviet Union down. I absolutely agree. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, to that point, uh, there's some small little anecdotes that are really fascinating about the Chernobyl accident. Um, if you're interested in just what's shockingly entertaining, um, Chernobyl, the TV show, I think HBO, it is actually really well done. Um, so in my mind, I don't think you could ever make a nuclear generator exploding be entertaining. Uh, but they definitely did a fantastic job of showing you the geopolitical environment from the Russia or the from the Soviet Union perspective. Uh, it was really well done. Um, so the, like, there's really small anecdotes within that. Uh, so there's a bridge uh, near uh, Chernobyl, and the smoke from the generator that exploded passed through that bridge, and there's about. 20 people that were standing on the bridge watching the fire and they all died every single one of them because the I'm not sure if you're aware but when it comes to radioactive particles they actually attach themselves to dust so you don't die from radiation going through your skin you die from breathing in uh, particles and then they heat up all your organs and that's how you die I'm not trying to get too gruesome here but like the idea is they were they thought they were seeing something cool a fire a very unique looking fire at that, and, and they all inadvertently died, moth to a flame kind of situation. Um, I, I guess this is a little bit off topic, but I do want to talk about it because my dad actually uh, got to meet this guy. Um, let, me, let me find him real fast. Hmm. Captain Warner, if I can comment on your map again, uh, a point that you touched on, but it's really critical for everyone to understand. The radiation, of course, does not affect just human beings, it affects everyone. Yes. Everyone and everything. Wherever you were in Europe, you were affected by this. Whether it was inability to buy milk, a warning not to eat any fruit and vegetables, even those potatoes in your joke, <laughs> that uh, it affected for an extended length of time every part of your life, wherever you were. So the implications of accidents like this are catastrophic for, for humanity. So it is critical that we do everything we can to prevent such disasters. And the fault of uh, the Soviet Union was exactly they did not, and they did not react quickly enough. I agree. Oh, and to your earlier point, the Soviet Union is a lie. Well, they, they, the Soviet Union repeatedly tried to mask the situation. Uh, there's actually uh, several, um, I guess, uh, examples of those miniature failures that just kind of coupled together and just showed how bad the Soviet Union reacted. Um, so to mask it, the event from their own people, they told children that were right, basically right next to the nuclear generator to continue to go to school. They were outside and German kids a thousand miles away were ordered inside. What is most fascinating is the NATO knew Chernobyl had exploded before the Moscow did because the nuclear sensors uh, on the Soviet border picked up the radio radioactive spike and the Soviet Union's leadership constantly was denying that it was impossible that a generator exploded. And so uh, the general that was in charge of operating uh, basically the containment protocol for Chernobyl was confused when he was watching media out of Germany where the kids were ordered inside uh, and his, his people were not and they were right next to the generator. So obviously there was some significant miscommunication and obviously um, beyond the miscommunication, they were trying to suppress that information as, as if nothing bad had happened.
so I, like, like I said, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's pertinent to the observation of uh, understanding the Soviet Union's perspective versus the American pr perspective. Lieutenant uh, Vasily Ap Apatko was a defector in uh, 1967. My dad was in the Air Force, um, and so he got to meet this man. He kind of uh, went around America uh, and basically just talked about the Soviet Union, his perspective. Um, and uh, so he flew his MiG-17 from East Germany into West, Germ uh, West Germany, and there's two stories. Uh, the Americans didn't pick him up. So he flew underneath all our radar because he was waiting for American planes to intercept him and then lead him to an airport. So he eventually had to crash the aircraft because he didn't know where he was going. So he defected into uh, West Germany, the United States, uh, gave him san a sanctuary inside the United States, and he started rounding. And within the first month or so, he uh, went to um, a grocery store. And um, he was looking around. And then they came in, he had uh, escorts, and he's like, so this is fake, right? He had never seen so much food displayed simultaneously ever in his life. It's the varieties, uh, the companies, the amount. Uh, he had never witnessed such things, and it had to be a lie. It had to be. It took him about a month longer to realize every town he went to it was the same thing uh, before he realized that it wasn't a lie, that America wasn't that bad. And the reason I bring this little anecdote up is because the Soviet propaganda machine was so powerful at convincing their own people about how bad America was. They were excellent at, like I said, taking that disinformation and warping it to, to a degree that, that really assisted them in uh, basically controlling their own population. So like, even if you had it bad in the Soviet Union, it was drastically worse in America, as you can see with all these videos. And it was technically true. It was just manipulated. It's like, it, it, basically, if the only media you were ever to consume from the United States were showing buildings on fire and uh, the poor on the side of the road and, and maybe a baby screaming, which is exactly what the Soviet Union did, uh, they were able to manipulate those kind of things to their, to their benefit. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, John? Awesome. Well, please give another round of applause to Wendell Bryant for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Wendell. Excellent job. So again, I would like to thank uh, Captain Bryant and all who joined us today, both in person and virtually. Uh, if you're interested in attending any of our other upcoming lectures, making a gift to IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please feel free to visit us at iwp.edu. Uh, thank you again, everybody. We really appreciate you guys coming out.